psychoanalyst in private practice and a fellow of the British Psychoanalytic Society, as well as being Professor of Modern Literary Theory at Goldsmiths College. He's the author of many books and articles on psychoanalysis, aesthetic theory and modern literature, including How to Read Freud and The Private Life, which are both over there, there's a few copies left. Um, while, we, um, while we remain in the dark, he, he was a finalist in the 2015 Notting Hill Editions Essay Prize for The Incurious Rabbit, which was originally delivered as a lecture for the site's 2015 annual conference. Um, that was last, last summer, wasn't it? So I think this book, I think, is a real lightness of touch to it. I really enjoyed it. It's very brave and quite inspiring. And I wondered how you found your way into psychoanalysis, and if you might say a bit about what your version of psychoanalysis is. That's okay? Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, uh, it's, it's a lovely question. I don't think we talk enough either um, about our versions of psychoanalysis or, I mean, when we talk about what gets us into psychoanalysis, we tend to respond in quite an externalised way. Um, we say that we think the clinical practice is interesting, that we read some portion of the theory somewhere and it resonated with something in us. But I think that there is something deeper and more thoroughgoing and that probably goes further back in our lives that um, draws us to this very strange activity of sitting and listening and occasionally responding to somebody who talks freely, mostly about their own suffering. Um, Did you always think that you'd end up doing it? No, I wouldn't go that far. Um, God, that, that, would, that would be a, a bit of kind of obnoxious precocity, depending on how far back they all, always goes. But I, I think I'd find a child who always knew he wanted to be a psychoanalyst. A bit frightening. <laughs> um, however, I, I, I mean, I, I do feel, and, and this kind of is, is, is vaguely present in the book, um, I do feel that one of the sources of my early fascination for the inner life was, uh, was Peanuts. And so maybe I modelled myself on, you know, Lucy and, mm. and Psychiatric Help Five Cents. Um, it's like Winnicott and Snoopy. Yes, yes, absolutely. And Linus, yeah. Um, I mean, um, what I think uh, the peanut strip did for me as a small child um, is that as a child, you know, a lot of people think because I'm very bookish now, I must have been um, a very bookish and cerebral child, and really nothing could be further from the truth. And I don't say that in the spirit of false modesty. I mean that that is how I kind of remember. Um, in a very kind of bodily way, my early experience that I went around in a kind of fog of obscurity and that every element of the world, um, of institutions and of other human beings, whether they were my age or whether they were much older, um, I found them utterly perplexing. Um, and this sense of the incomprehensibility of the world, um, of being alone in a world that exceeded my comprehension, that was much bigger than me. Um, I, I, I think it, it was really conditioning. I think it's the way I found myself drawn to literature. Because for me, literature was a, a way of kind of keeping faith with that texture of experience as deeply confusing. Um, and that didn't try to resolve the questions. Um, which was why I found school very difficult because it was it seemed to me always to be providing kind of quick and efficient answers mm. um, and so I mean I think that stayed with me I, I, I really think that that early sense of, of self had probably just persisted for various readings reasons through through the course of, of my young life into university and that's the kind of thinking and the kind of writing and um, probably the kind of human relationship as well that I was, I was interested in. Um, and so it's not surprising 
um, in that mm. sense, that my, my inner life found so much resonance with Freud mm. as soon as I came across him. Um, and that when in my early 30s I sort of found myself at a bit of a loss, really, um, I, I, I sort of come to, uh, to establish myself in an academic career with a kind of indecent speed and unreflective, unreflectiveness. And um, I, I, I had a very kind of early midlife crisis. So I found myself in analysis and I found myself um, uh, kind of drawn to, yes, wanting to do something else uh, other than mark undergraduate essays for the rest of my life. Mm. Suddenly felt like looking down the barrel of a gun, I have to say. So it's almost if you kind of couldn't have continued doing that in the same way. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And um, I sort of went into analysis in the expectation that I would just be weaned off academic life and mm. that, that literary life would lose its charm. Mm. One of the sort of miraculous and quite inconvenient things it did was that it kind of re-enchanted literature for me and, and, and gave me some understanding of why I'd been drawn to it in the first place, which I think in the early years of an academic literary career I just lost. Mm. Um, it became kind of a dry object of, of scholarly um, uh, inquiry for me. And I'd, lo I'd lost that kind of visceral interior relationship to it, that sense of, of something really being at stake, of life mm. being at stake. In a book. So you're kind of studying interiority, but but you you, you weren't feeling it. I wasn't. Feeling it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think um, uh, in a way that that sort of starts to answer the, the, mm. the other question about mm. about my version of psychoanalysis, my version of psychoanalysis, um, insofar as I can kind of state it propositionally at all, is that um, uh, it's about giving somebody the space to um, to give voice to the unresolved character of their experience, to, to give voice to that sense of perplexity, of incomprehension, um, and the chance to sit with it, not to resolve it too quickly, um, uh, but to actually allow oneself to have a kind of humane and curious mm. relationship to it, um, uh, and and to be someone who, who can receive it mm. and, and respond to it with his own perplexed inner life. So, how did you decide where to go for this? Um, well, I you know. I, there are different answers to that. I, I, first of all, I met a psychoanalyst in the British society. I mean, it, you know, it, in a way, it was as straightforward as that. I, I, that doesn't mean I can't, you know, it would, it would be dishonest to say that because that's where he was, that's where I went, because he wasn't mm -hmm. actually somebody, you know, he, he sort of facilitated um, uh, my, my, my interest in training there, but uh, in no sense did I find him sort of so inspiring or compelling that mm. I had to do or what he did or be what, who he was, mm. but... Um, you go straight for a five times a week? I went straight for a five, I was referred to a five times a week analyst, so of course that, that, that did sort of set me in the context mm. of training at the Institute, and also I find myself deeply help, helped and therefore identified mm. with the intensive model. Um, and. The thing is, because I didn't have a kind of intellectual theoretical stake in, in a model of frequency, you know, that in a sense, the model of frequency chose me. Um, uh, I, as soon as it was offered to me, I felt not, oh gosh, I feel like I'm being railroaded into taking, you know, in, into, into taking this on when I don't really want to, and it's all about the requirements for training. That might be true for some people, but for me, um, as soon as it was offered to me, I thought, my God, that's exactly what I need. Mm. Um, mm. I, I, I really like the model of, of sort of, you know, an unbroken day-by-day -day conversation, um, which I, I felt was really desperately overdue for me. Um, so I think it, it was probably a lot to do with 
finding it a very kind of conducive method to getting in touch with my own unconscious. Um, I looked at other trainings um, and I thought that the emphasis was more on a particular theoretical, not, not always, but in some cases. I mean, I looked at a Lacanian training and I thought it was based on a particular theoretical orientation at the time. That wasn't really what, what um, felt most urgent because, you know, I, the one thing that I'd gotten quite good at over the previous 10 years was reading theory. Um, I didn't feel, feel that was why I needed the help, really. And, um, you know, the British Society, which is a complicated and, and, and faulty organisation in all kinds of ways, but it was... I, I found it kind of oddly hospitable in, in, in the sense, in, in its clinical, in its emphasis on clinical training. Were people kind to you then? What was it like? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, it, 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 it was probably um, as various in terms of the kind of human encounters as, uh, well, no, okay, it's slightly over, over blank, blank, but I was going to say as various um, in, in the variety of human encounters as the world itself. Um, probably not quite that varied, but um, uh, I, I do think that um, there isn't a kind of um, obvious or single type um, that, that, you know, that, that people sort of found, seem to have found their way to psychoanalysis by a kind of multitude of different paths and um, have preserved a sense of their own character structure. So, you know, I met quite early on someone like Kit Bolas, who just really impressed me um, as, you know, another human being rather than an analyst. Mm. An analyst. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and I met, you know, other analysts with other orientations, um, but also a, a very different sense of human face, of, of, of rapport. So, um, so some, some of the people that I encountered along the way, I found um, officious um, and kind of suspicious as well, actually. Mm. Um, uh, suspicious, you know, kind of anti-intellectual mm. um, and uh, a little bit sort of um, standoffish. But other people I found incredibly congenial and... Do you feel, do you feel that your, your literary um, knowledge and talent and interest was something that, that could add to it or, or did you have to put it to the side of it while you learnt psychoanalytic stuff in the way that they wanted you to? Um, I think I... I think for a while I had to put it aside for my own purposes. Um, although, actually, the, the little book on Freud I wrote very early on in the training. Um, I think he even I started it while I was applying for the training. And it was just a way of making sense for myself mm. of what I was doing and what my fascination for psychoanalysis was. So, um, I didn't... I mean, to be honest, when I think about the relationship of the institution to my literary interests, rather than feeling that there was a feeling or an opinion at all. Um, I, I think of sort of Deirdre Bear, the, the biographer, um, talking to Beckett about writing his biography, and he says, I will neither help nor hinder you. Mm. And I kind of felt that that was more or less the attitude of the institution, you know, that as far as the relationship between psychoanalysis and literature goes, we will neither help you mm. nor end you, you mm. will have to work it mm. out for yourself. Um, is, it, is it still as it, as it used to be a long time ago where you have a bunch of Kleinians and a bunch of Freudians and a few middly types that are kind of outnumbered but have some kind of sort of position there? Um, do, do you have to, to declare your interest? It, it, well, 
I mean, the history here is, is complicated. I mean, you probably all know that um, uh, after the controversial discussions during the war, the um, controversies about the admissibility of Kleinian theory were resolved by means of something called the Gentleman's Agreement, the Gentleman's Agreement, which was actually um, brokered by three women, um, uh, in which they found a structure in which the three, three strands of British psychoanalysis could coexist um, uh, without, without splitting the organisation. Um, and this persisted in the training by having two different tracks in the training, one of which was, uh, was Kleinian and one of, the, one of which was a mix of, 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 Anna, of Anna Freudian and, and Middle Group. Um, and that was, that gentleman's agreement was dissolved in the training about ooh, 15 years ago, I think. Um, so you no longer trained in a particular, you know, I didn't train in a group. Um, but of course, my analyst had an orientation, everyone's analyst has an orientation, so the groups continue to exist. Um, and again, the relationship between them is actually quite various. I mean, there's no, um, you know, there are entrenchments in places, there is uh, a sense of, you know, some. Among some analysts, you'll meet of defining oneself quite rigidly in opposition to other strands, and in all groups, there are also strands of genuine openness um, and curiosity about how other people do things. Mm. Mm. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I was sort of, I was kind of imagined that that the institute, I mean, it, it's not very good at coming out of its place and talking to anybody else, everyone that's assumed to be interested has to sort of come to them. So it's a kind of enclosed sort of aspect to it. Yeah, I mean that, um, that goes back deep into the roots of its mm. history and uh, I do think that there is a younger generation of analysts mm. now mm. who really are trying to change that, um, uh, not just in terms of kind of outreach, although I think its outreach activity mm. is improving a lot, but also, in a way more importantly, in terms of admissions, um, uh, when I applied, the admissions procedure was ridiculously forbidding. You know, mm. you had to you had to write a letter first before you could even be sent um, <laughs> the initial information, let alone the application form. Um, uh, as though you know, every approach had to be treated with um, with suspicion. Mm. Um, you had to sort of get the message that not anybody was even allowed to be interested. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, it's like a sort of like golf clubs operating. Yeah, yeah, that was. To know a certain uh, people. Except they let Jews in. So we can get, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> which, which was lucky. Mm. Um, uh, but I guess the sort of the five times a week gold standard is, is what, that's, it's always been upheld there, hasn't it, as a training. Yeah. Idea. Yeah, and of course it's going. It, it has come under pressure, mm. and it will continue to come under pressure. Um, mm. And it will, it will evolve. But mm. um, uh, how, how do you get accepted for training? What, 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 what do you who, who do you have to play around golf with uh, to, to get oh, in? I, yeah, I, I, do you, is it interviews or? Yeah, it's interviews. Yeah. Um, you know, it? It's a long application form. Mm. Um, which actually is an interesting, I have to say, it's an interesting document mm. um, because you are asked to just, you know, spill your, your inner life and your history on the page. Um, and then, yeah, you have two long interviews, um, some of which, I mean, you know, there's no point in pretending. Some, some, some people uh, in the past, including some of my colleagues, have found them quite traumatising. Mm. Um, I had one which was difficult and one which was mm. revelatory, actually. Mm. Um, uh, the, 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 the second person that interviewed me came, came to be, um, and, and partly on the back of that interview, a supervisor, a mentor, and I would say, you know, as one of the kind of former, formative people in my analytic mm. life. Um, so again, a kind of a, a, a real variety of experience, mm. I think. 
And that's all what, for four years or so, is it? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's it's a bit like a you know a continental university degree. You mm. take as long as um, as as it takes to get you the credits, and it, 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 in a way, I think, um, and I don't think it's unique like this among the mm. trainings, but I do like the fact that. Um, it tailors itself to the circumstances of your life. Mm. Um, so, you know, um, people like me with, with young families could, mm. could delay and um, there's no kind of, there's no panic. Um, there are rivalries, of course, at all kinds of levels, but actually not particularly about finishing first, mm. which is very important, I think. Uh, do, do they still do the thing where one's analyst writes a, a recommendation report for you? No, no, that, that stopped about, actually, again, about a year before I started right, okay. that practice stopped, yeah. Because mm. I, I was just imagining, you know, being in analysis with someone and really wanting to train, and if that person then writes a report and has a decisive influence on whether you can get in or not, would really affect what I might say in my analysis, yes. or the, the kind of per image I wanted to, to portray. I mean, interesting, my analyst told me that uh, although the, the practice had been dropped a year before, um, he simply didn't, mm. he'd refused to do it for a long time. Mm. Mm. And there were, there were, you know, a number of, uh, of analysts who just didn't comply mm. with the requirement for precisely the reason mm. you're saying. Um, so in your practice now, do you, do you see people maybe five times a week, or, or how, how um, does that sit in the outside of the training? Uh, outside of the training, you know, it's 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 very difficult, mm. um, obviously, to to get five times a week patients. At the moment, I have one. Um, mm. I'm not that bothered about mm. it actually. Mm. Um, uh, Quite happy with her twice a week quite happy with the once a week. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I, mm. I really don't think that the, the quality of the work you do is tied exclusively to frequency. Um, frequency is an interesting kind of player in the mix mm. of what conditions a good analytic rapport. Mm. Um, and there is something qualitatively different about a high frequency treatment, um, about the shared unspoken knowledge between you that you will be able to come back to this mm. um, the next day or in a couple of days. Um, but it's also very possible to do very analytic, dry, mm. poor contact work at five times a week and, and possible to do mm. very strong analytic mm. work once a week. Mm. So so to imagine that the alchemy is somehow invested in the number itself, I think, is, mm. is quite mad. Mm. So this book is, is, is a real sort of in-depth getting a feel for the private self in all sorts of ways. Um, do you feel that, that, that private life is under threat in these times now? What, what do you, what's your position on it? Yeah, I, I, I really do. Um, I think there is probably something a bit nostalgic or dinosaurish um, about that kind of lament. Um, I think because of the increasing sovereignty of a model in our culture and our society of positivism, a positive psychology, um, but also, I mean, you know, positivism at so many levels, um, a, a kind of outcomes based, um, metrically driven, results based mm. culture that, of course, um, uh, has, has, has kind of uh, has, has a, a claw grip on our mental health services. Mm. Um, on our conception of what mental health is, um, but also on our sense of the inner life. And there are very mm. few places where the ambiguities um, and the uncertainties of the inner life are allowed to abide. Mm. Mm. Um, so, yes, I mean, I, I, I think... Do you think we don't value it enough, is that? What happens? Yeah, we, we sort of it's a resource, so it's, it's something crucial to us that we're losing. I think 
there, there's an increasing sense for me, um, you know, I, I mean, I've talked to a lot of young people in different contexts, in my family, of course, but also in, in, in university, um, that people almost value it without knowing anymore what it is they value because of a tacit coercion into a kind of increasingly permanent broadcast, uh, an increasingly mm. permanent externalization of their own selves um, on social media in particular. Um, uh, but, you know, enforced at so many levels, I think in, in, enforced at the level of kind of tabloid reality TV culture, where um, selfhood is modeled on what you can show the world. Mm. Um, so interiority just isn't a value that is very widely transmitted mm. anymore. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I think it's not that um, young people are now so identified with this externalized model of selfhood that they just um, meekly comply with it and, and dissolve themselves into it. It's that they have an inchoate sense a lot of the time um, that something is missing, is missing um, from this culture of kind of relentless it, it is a relentless positivity, really, mm. because mm. the demand to externalise is the demand to assert oneself and to make oneself present um, and, and therefore not to have the necessary, I think, experience of absence, absence from the world, even absence from oneself, sometimes certainly absence from those around us. Mm. I really like the way in your book that you that you sort of problematise you know the whole question of um, whether going to analysis is a case of us shining a light on people's unconscious and then dragging that out into the open to kind of see what it is and make an inventory of who they really are and how that that sort of resisted so much by people they'd rather be in the dark a bit. You mentioned when dreams are brought out into the light how odd it feels sometimes to look at dreams in the light of day, as if they'd rather be back in a sort of a darker recess somewhere. Yeah. I, I really feel that dreams need certain conditions, not only under which to become intelligible, but actually, in a way, to become an object of interest. You know, the, the, it, it, it fascinates me that a dream that is told at the breakfast table can be as boring as it is compulsive in the consulting room. Mm. Um, and I think that's because um, there are certain conditions of thinking and listening um, that, that are required to, 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 to hear at the, at the frequency of dreams, to, to hear at the sort of transmission frequency of dreams, that when we I mean, you know, to use Beyond's ideas about the confusion of psychic and sensuous reality, we hear dreams in daylight as though they belong to the realm of sensuous reality. And then they, they, they of course, because they don't comply with that reality, they, they seem a bit exhausting. And we can't kind of keep pace with... Mm their logic or um, their mode of thinking. Mm. And, and then sort of later on, you, you kind of, you, you mentioned Winnicott's idea that perhaps there's a, a kernel, a part of ourselves that we want nobody to ever know, however many times we go to analysis, and that's essential to our identity. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, really, that thought is the core of, of the book. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, if, if there's any one paper that I would want to invoke in, in, in setting up my stall, mm. in saying what my version of analysis was, I'd probably find it there. Mm. Um, it's an extraordinary piece of work, that paper. Um, and yes, I mean, you know, 
Winnicott is brave enough, I think, in that paper, you know, as our kind of leading light of, of, of the British society, to say that, that a lot of people hate psychoanalysis and for very good reason. Mm. Because um, uh, psychoanalysis for too long has seen, has, has kind of abused its power and has seen its authority as a license to, um, to borrow into the deepest recesses of the other without much sensitivity of what that will mean for the other. For it's the abused other. its power. Yeah, that's yeah. a big, yeah. big statement. Yeah, well, um, uh, I, I, I don't think he's pointing the finger necessarily at anyone in particular or any kind no. of school or any kind of practice. I think it's more not being alive um, you know, in, in the kind of zeal, the evangelical zeal of the early decades of the psychoanalytic movement, that they probably weren't alive to how frightening and how vulnerable mm. um, uh, the analytic situation can be. Mm. Um, There's that Winnicott quote, isn't there, where he said that to have one's core self violated is nothing, a mere bagatelle. No, 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 no. Yeah, to, to be, yeah, to be, yeah, to be right, raped and eaten yeah. by cannibals yeah. is nothing, a mere bagatelle when compared to having one's core self violated. Yeah. Which by that, I think he means an analyst with a torch yeah. shining it in your yeah, face absolutely. and dragging you out yeah. into the open yeah. in some way. Yeah, I mean, I think rape and cannibalism probably <laughs> also, <laughs> also violate well. He's got a sense of humour though, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, he does, yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, uh, surprisingly kind of I really like this sentence that you write. You said, you can no more be a reliable witness to the workings of your unconscious than to the burglary committed when you're out for the evening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, wow, that, you know, you weren't there, you don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. You don't know yeah. what they did. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, and I, I also find that kind of, I mean, it's, it's I suppose you could say it's kind of metapsychological, it's epistemological, that statement, but for me there's also something kind of humane about it, mm. in, in the sense that, um, of course it's not about, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's nothing worse than that version of psychoanalysis that says, oh, it's my unconscious, so I don't need to, no, sorry, it was my unconscious. Mm. Um, you know, I was rude or I was abusive, yeah, sorry. Mm. I, um, I, I don't mm. mean that at all. Um, but I, I, I do mean that um, it's only if you start with that sense of, um, of um, dispossession by the unconscious that you can start to take responsibility for it. Mm. Um, if, you st if you start from the premise that you are the master of your unconscious, that you know what's going on there, then you're going to be its victim. Mm. Um, that's a kind of pseudo responsibility, yeah. and real responsibility to the unconscious starts by acknowledging its limits, mm. by saying, I, I, "Yeah, I'm, I'm responsible," but not not in spite of, but because I don't really know what's going on. Mm. I also really, I really liked your story about the policeman. Oh yeah. And when it comes to sort of protecting privacy, <laughs> do you want to tell it or shall I? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, Josh was there working in his consulting room morning or something normal yeah. very normal day no no i mean i, I want to say there's there's one i mean it was a very normal day except for one yeah. thing and I, I mean i can't people keep saying to me you know was there a literary license now there is some literary license in yeah. various industries but there is no literary license yes, you, in couldn't, this you couldn't make it up you couldn't make it up this was okay. the first day in my new practice Post qualification, right? the very first, the first morning, the first session mm. of the first mm. morning. Mm. Okay, so there he is doing his thing, looking serious probably, and you know, listening to the this young man who was quite sort of diffident and yeah. unsure, yeah. sitting there opposite, and there's a knock on the door, and it's two policemen there, and so Josh thinks he better go to the door, and because the police, you you kind of have to go and see what they want, can't they? 
if you ignore them, they just knock again, they're the police. Yeah. So it goes to the door and says, um, hello. And the police say, we've had a report of a, a loud noise and disturbance at this address. <laughs> He's quietly doing analysis with this <laughs> poor man. And he said, well, I'm actually working with this poor man here, the, 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 this, this fellow here. Um, and the police say, can we come in? And you say, well, OK, because they're the police. And the police wander in and have a little look around. And this poor man is looking a bit bemused on the, on the couch. And the police look at the books a bit and wander around. And they say, has there been any disturbance here? And the, the young man says, no, no. no. And you were feeling quite sort of self-conscious, weren't you? As if, you know, um, could you please leave? And they took their time and eventually said, there doesn't appear to be a disturbance here. We should then leave. And they both left. Leaving you thinking that you hadn't protected the privacy of your patients. That you kind of allowed them in. Which is fascinating. It was a real... The law comes into yeah, your session. Yeah, and it was a proper, you know, and I, I, I you know, the, obviously the phrase comes to mind um, for, for obvious reasons, but it was a shock and awe moment. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, but, you know, I mean, I, I invoke the, 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 the first paragraph of the trial, because how could you mm. not? Um, it was that a Kafka story before the law, isn't there, where yeah, it's just not yeah. allowed in? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it was just this sort of overwhelming force or, you know, presence of the law. Um, and, you know, al almost as it was happening, uh, I think, I mean, I think at one point I say, you know, the only thought unhelpfully that came to mind was Jesus. Um, mm. uh, but it was, it, was, it was a kind of, you know, it was a, a, a fantastic encounter in a way mm. with, um, with with what Zizek I suppose would call the you know mm. the obscene underside of the law. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I like the way in your book that you really mix up the sort of high brown and low brown and that you sort of you range far and wide from Adam and Eve to Hannah Arendt to Snoopy to Katie Price, all over the place. And I've just been reading a biography of Winnicott. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's a bit in it I wanted to think about in terms of privacy, as to how people think psychoanalysts must be sane, sensible people, but this is some stuff that happened in Winnicott's life, where um, he was married for 26 years to Alice, who was fairly crazy at, at a lot of the time, and they adopted, semi-adopted, a psychotic girl, Susan, to come and live with them. And I guess sort of, this is in the spirit of the Kardashians in these days, a sort of crossover kind of thing. And so you get Winnicott and his wife, who have a celibate and unconsummated marriage for 26 years, living with Susan, who's crazy. Susan is in analysis with Marion Milner, who is Winnicott's best friend. Winnicott is also analyst to Marion Milner's husband for a number of years. And when that finishes, he becomes analyst to Marion Milner for a number of years. Because he knows her quite well, he feels a little bit un uneasy about this, and he goes to analyse her at her own house, rather than at his normal practice. Which gets weirder and weirder, this. Right? So, um, and Winnicott, sends his first wife, Alice, to analysis with his best friend, Clifford Scott. When he ends his marriage to Alice, he sends wife number two, Claire, to Clifford Scott, who's his best friend. And when Winnicott leaves Alice to go and live with Claire, poor old mad Susan's got nowhere to live because she can't live with mad Alice. So she has to go and stay with somebody else. And she goes to live with someone called Mrs. Brown. And then she promptly has a big breakdown after that. And that's a sort of an example of how things were in those days. It's kind of, kind of crazy. 
kind of crazy and you wonder how just a generation afterwards um, uh, you know, psychoanalysts develop this reputation for being rigid and uptight. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, what, what, what happens in privacy with this lot? You know, where, where, who doesn't know everything about everybody else in all of this? It's quite extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's an astonishing kind of anarchy. Yeah, really, yeah. Um, about the internal relationships um, and you know one can I mean one can point to other moments in history I mean, mm. uh, you know repeatedly um, after Beyond saw Beckett at, at the tabby they, they would they would go for, mm. for a job mm. at the bar. Well, would you would you fancy being one of Melanie Klein's children do you think if you had your time again? Uh, the children of this lot seem to have had quite a hard yeah, time. It, it didn't seem to work out that well for, yeah. for um, Eric, was it? For, yeah. Well, Eric, but also uh, yeah. uh, what's uh, yeah? Because <laughs> didn't, yeah. didn't Melanie Klein ask Winnicott to see her son Eric? And then she asked if it was okay if she supervised that analysis. <laughs> so they were like. Yeah. It was, you know, in terms of privacy, they were writing a lot about privacy, but th there wasn't, I don't know if it was a different concept of it then, or, or quite what it was. I, it's, it's quite extraordinary goings on. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it, who knows what um, Winnicott's paper on internal silence came out of, but Clearly, the governing motif from Freud in the early psychoanalytic movement was light. Mm. Um, uh, that, yes, they were venturing into an obscure, shadowy territory, but they were coming with torches. And in a sense, that meant a liberation of dark or obscure corners of human relationships, yeah. like marriages or parents and children. You know, I mean, one of the inaugural psychoanal psychoanalyses of, um, uh, you know, of the movement is, is, is Sigmund's mm. analysis of his daughter. Mm. Um, and I think that the whole architecture of boundaries and of... Um, that sense of kind of the flammability of the analytic setting, the sense that um, it is indeed not just a scene of enlightenment, but of violation, mm. of shame. Um, I think that probably comes out of a kind of belated understanding of what all this kind of um, you know, restricted, yes, but there's this kind of mad openness. Mm, mm. Um, do, you, openness. Do, you, do you think that psychoanalysis, as it generally is these days, has responses and answers to sort of contemporary issues of subjectivity and the things that people are worried about, troubled by, um, made unhappy by? I, I suspect that we're not as interested, too many of us are not as interested as we should be. Um, uh, that, I mean, a lot of analysts, I think, are becoming a lot more political in the current climate. Um, but I often get the sense that they almost come out of their analytic persona in order to do that, that they don't see it as something mm. integral. Yeah. That they don't, but yeah, they're, they're kind of almost a bit wary of offering mm. a diagnosis of what's going on from, mm. from the position um, they occupy. Um, so you get a kind of much more externalised sort of sociological analysis. Right? Um, mm. I, I, I think we should be interested in a kind of an analytic understanding of what is happening to psychic life now. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, and, and, you know, in a way that means, that would mean, yeah, giving analysis mm. back to politics. Mm. 
Well, how about something like um, disclosure during the course of an analysis? If, you know, if someone comes in and says, I saw this amazing film, The Revenant or something, right. last week, and you'd seen it, w would you feel okay about talking about what, that film? I would. Admitting to seeing it or? I think so. I think so. Um, mm. So I remember you saying a while ago that, that someone said to you that my patients would never ever know if I'd read Hamlet yeah. or not. Yeah, as far as well, he said, yeah, the, the, the line was, as uh, this was a, a, a consultant I saw, um, he, he said, as far as my patients are concerned, I have not read Hamlet. Right. Um, which I think is, mm. is, is kind of even more absolutist than they don't know. Yeah. Because if they don't know, they can assume. But I think mm. if, in, if in his internal setting he hasn't read it, then um, none of his responses can come out of, mm. um, uh, you know, his own unconscious relationship to that text. Now, you know, I just don't know how to make sense of that. Mm. I really don't. Um, uh, I think the, the mistake is to imagine that if you ignore, well, for me, it's a mistake to imagine that if you acknowledge you've seen a film, then you're moving out of an analytic register mm. Mm. Um, and, you know, you're having a kind of externalised pub talk. No, I mean, um, you are asking about the film, um, what you ask about any other piece of material. Um, uh, in other words, it, it becomes a piece of psychic reality. Yeah. The fact that it, it, that it has um, uh, an independent external existence outside the consultant doesn't matter any more than the fact that his mm. apartment or his, mm. his girlfriend mm. um, has, has mm. have existences outside the consultant. You know, mm. all of this comes to you mm. um, as, as communications from the inner life. And... and um, uh, I, I don't think you are pulling it out of that register any more than you acknowledge the fact that you know what a pub is or yeah. you know what an office is. Mm. No, I, I agree with that. You want to be um, at, right at the interface of psychic and political life than then do some work with, with, with someone from the city. Um, it, it is... Um, the, the, I mean, first of all, the sheer kind of quantitative levels of pathology that I think um, uh, life in the city induces um, is just staggering um, and, and, and a real education. But um, the kind of imperative to, uh, to performance, to um, almost psychotic identification with, um, with their institutions, um, uh, the sense that, you know, um, in exchange for large salaries, um, the corporation takes over um, their daily um, psychic and bodily lives. You know, what, what does it really mean to have a building that, that has, you know, uh, a luxury canteen and a luxury gym, in other words, somewhere you never need to leave. Doctors and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That is really kind of conquering all the spaces for interruption, um, uh, for pause um, in, in, in daily life. And um, I, I, I mean, so often, people you know who come, who have come from the city, um, either anticipating the day early in the morning or coming <coughs> at, uh, you know um, at seven in the evening. Um, every session starts with a kind of mini breakdown. It seems to me with a kind of um, uh, draining away of. Uh, a manic energy that has placed enormous stress um, on on the nervous system, um, and it's it, 
does it actually in, in a way you, there's no space for the negative there it's just it's just a, a kind of an onrush of stimulus so you're forced into a kind of Winnicottian management plan rather than analysis exactly mm. exactly I, th I think that and, and you know it's it's striking how people who have internalized that atmosphere and um, been dissolved into it um, cannot hear intimations of the negative at all um, uh, and so any interpretations you make around that are they're not even bounced away it's almost as though they just fall into a dark hole there's just no place for them to go um, so you, yeah, you spend a long time. They have no value. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Which, which is right. Mm. I mean, they, they've kind of valued them correctly. Mm. It does. You know, a long time, a long time ago now, um, Adorno really had this very powerful critique of the left as never understanding how language itself is political, that certain mobilizations of language, the idea that, that, that political truths can only be communicated in um, propositional sentences, is actually very corrosive because, again, you get no intimation of the negative, which of course was what... what so, doubt is subversive. You know, it's it's not it, it, doubt is not about liberal fence sitting. Um, uh, it's not about saying, well, they're right, but they're right too. Um, d doubt is a position, and, and one should have, you know, if one if one has some um, kind of uh, um, fanatical conviction on anything, it should be doubt. You talk about uh, psychoanalysis psychoanalysts being reticent, I mean, you know, you're being an exception, mm -hmm. about talking about politics or linking psychoanalytic uh, thinking to politics. There was, I don't know whether people saw it on Newsnight the other night, one of those American, it was the, it was the Republican actually, they had the Republican and the Democrat commentators on the primaries. And in, it may, may seem a bit crude, but he was saying that Trump, because most of the establishment Republicans don't like him, is, is an example, we talked about Freud in psychoanalysis, of the return of the repressed of the Bush years. Things that have just not been faced about the Iraq war and neoconservatism, it's coming back with a vengeance. And it was actually quite interesting that, that, that he, you know, he put that forward. There, there, there's, there's, there's maybe possibilities there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know anybody else saw that. No, I didn't, I, mean, I didn't see it, but it is, it is interesting. Um, I mean, when the repressed returns, it's always much more chaotic. I mean, you know, the return is fast. Um, and, you know, in that sense, Trump's incoherence, I think, is incredibly instructive. Um, the sense that he doesn't just um, represent um, an amplified version of Bush's neoconservatism. On the contrary, in, 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 in many ways, he's this weird mix of... Um, uh, sort of um, cartoon-like bellicosity, but also um, uh, of, of um, protectionism and, uh, and and isolationism. I mean, he, he, you know, and he can he can bring all these all these completely contradictory currents in American political thinking together because, um, in a sense, everything he does is now contentless. Training and my own experience of analysis, above all, um, taught me that there are no brilliant transformative interpretations, and um, that um, uh, to imagine there are is really just to be seduced into compliance. You know, God, he's so insightful, um, uh, and 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 in a way, then to be to be stuck in um, uh, an insoluble, positive, erotic or, or positive transference. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm probably most 
British in my psychoanalytic identity and, and really believing in the setting and believing that the alchemy of, of psychoanalysis resides in the fact that somebody opens the door reliably to you and makes themselves receptive to whatever it is you have to say, however urgent and painful or however trivial and seemingly irrelevant. Um, that, that somebody is interested in the drift of your mind, especially in the current socio-cultural and political climate, I think does have an alchemical force to it. Just being there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I love um, uh, a phrase of, um, of Enid Balance um, at the end of one of a, a paper called Creative Life. She just talks about um, the analysts being absolutely there. Um, and I think in, in describing that as, as boldly as she does, she, she does get at something like the alchemy. Um, the alchemy, you know, it's, it's, it has to do with what Winnicott calls being alone in the presence of somebody else. Um, because that silent, unmarked presence, I think, is what allows something new to come into being. Which can feel something like magic, although not, not, a, not a kind of a mystified magic. I've always thought it's a bit of a, a mug's game to be going around thinking that my chosen theory, my technique is a better truth finding vehicle than the next bloke, if you like, or the next person's, you know, that if I find my Lacanian that makes me have a far, lot more direct access to truth and psychoanalytic progress than if I was a Kleinian, if I was a Freudian or whatever. You know, as if these things, the, these techniques, these positions kind of de define us. And sort of in training, if I admired the Kleinian position, say, I might identify with certain Kleinian people, I want to be the best Kleinian that I can be, and then spend my life thinking that everything else is inferior goods yeah. or, you know, not as good a way of progressing in a psychoanalysis. Mm. It's a Richard Rorty sort of idea, I suppose, isn't it? Of, there's no sort of best truth story. Yeah. Or way of finding it for people in yeah. analysis. Yeah. But then why psychoanalysis? Um, Either if that's if that's true, why is that analysis? Why not um, Gestalt? Uh, well, why not? Well, I, I would argue. I would argue against that. I would argue against it. Could you? What would you say? Yeah, I would. I would say that psychoanalysis offers something of a depth and a level of inquiry. Even if you don't force a theory on the patient, that other, you, you know, other larger than reach. Yes, no, I, I, I could not agree with that, I feel. But I, I, I mean, I don't think that the entailment of what you're saying necessarily has to be, um, uh, you know, that there's nothing then to choose. But I, I actually think you can have quite a strong and robust theoretical identity that isn't organised around an identification. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I, I, I don't think I want to get into those, I don't, don't think you particularly want to get into the place where um, one sort of cherry picks indifferently between different theories as though mm. one had no investment in them, as though mm. they didn't you know, resonate mm. um, at different levels mm. more powerfully, so it could resonate more powerfully than others. Because part of getting you and others along here is to broaden all this out, yeah. to hear what people from over there think about this or that, you know, to hear different versions of people's psychoanalysis. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And to break down that kind of culty sort of separateness yeah. that can exist. Yeah. Doctrinaire sort of regimes, I suppose. Yeah. And I mean, you know, in response to 
it's part response to what about Gestalt. I mean, yes, I absolutely would, would want to defend the and, and speak for the specificity and the power of psychoanalysis, but I also um, think that one of the pleasures of psychoanalysis is, is that it enjoins us to, to read everything and to be interested mm. in everything. Mm. Yeah. Is there a question from, from there, Jim? Yeah, no, I was wondering about um, um, transference interpretations and how um, sort of an insistence upon that. And uh, some, I'm just wondering whether doesn't that sometimes disrupt what you were talking about, that, uh, that sort of, um, what did you call it, the alchemy? Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, when transference interpretation becomes a, a religion, becomes a kind of, you know, a sacred article of practice. Um, I mean, there are different models of, of um, transference-only interpretation, now, which is interesting, you know, because people associate it exclusively with Kleinianism, but there's actually a certain kind of American relational model that, that that does the same, but not in a kind of depth psychology way, more kind of referring to, if you like, the, the surface affects um, at the level of the present interaction. It doesn't make much reference to the deep past or to the unconscious fantasy. So, um, I, I mean, the reason I say that is, is because I think there is something about the exclusive reference to the present that actually undermines the integrity and the specificity of, of the place you're coming from. Because I think although those come from different places, they start to feel the same. Someone who, who can't stop pulling all the different layers of psychic experience into the present, sometimes by means of, you know, a kind of, I don't know, a, a kind of Houdiniism, um, that I, 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 I mean, I can often admire it when I see it done well, but I don't understand it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a big, I, I really find helpful the French distinction between interpretation in and interpretation of the transference. I believe, I, I, I believe Betty Joseph is onto something when she says that there is no level of communication that doesn't have a transference resonance. I just don't believe you always have to interpret it. You have to be alive to it, um, and it has to it has to serve and inform um, uh, listening and interpretation at some level. But but why does it have to be externalised in the form of an interpretation? Joanna. Rationality. I was a Marxist to feminist, God knows what. And that refusal of that con those kinds of conversations was the most profound um, sort of disruption mm. of a particular way of being that opened something else up. Um, a sort of madness, a kind of a, a sort of very kind of mad things that were said that opened something completely different. And I suppose I would say that's for me the alchemy. Mm. I don't know what you think. No, I think that's lovely. Um, uh, and I think there is something about militancy that can often sound so much like a kind of plea for relief from, you know, the kind of the, the, the tyranny of doctrine, the, the grip that it gets on the mind. Um, uh, the, the kind of yeah, con constrains the flow of the imagination. And so something that, that breaks that up, um, I think it's I, I really, I mean, I use the word subversive again because I think that it, it interrupts a kind of positional politics and 
instead open open to you. I mean, just like in a way, just like it, it you know, Freud says he um, radically expands the um, the scope of of sexuality. I think probably it's the same with politics. That politics doesn't have to be the exchange of um, of, of of received propositional statements and opinions. Thank you very much. That's okay. a pleasure. Thank you for being so open and so generous. Pleasure.